Okay, so we're we're so lucky to have uh, Troy Hunt here. Uh, as far as I know, uh, Troy lives in the Gold Coast of Australia and is the creator of the mighty website Have I Been Pond. He's a Microsoft M MVP for developer security and a Microsoft Regional Director. He was recently awarded OSCERT's Individual Excellence in Information Security Award, the Grand Prix Prize for the overall security blog and the European Security Blogger Award. Hi, hi Troy. G'day. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good day. That's, that's the best uh, introduction I think I, I've ever heard. Uh, so what, what's, what's your current role and what does a typical day involve for you? Oh, wow. Well, yeah, I, I guess the the current role is, uh, it, it, it's varied. Uh, most people think of, of me, I, I think these days related to Have I Been Pwned. So a lot of my time, increasingly a large amount of time goes into Have I Been Pwned. I still travel and speak a lot. Uh, I still write blogs. Uh, I do a lot of a lot of media stuff, mostly around data breaches. And, and my typical day is a little bit all over the place uh, now that now that we can travel more than what we used to a few years ago, we're, we're back to doing that. I do a lot of that for, I think I do more more of it for fun these days than what I used to, but I still kind of mix it up a lot. So yeah, that, that makes things a little bit unpredictable and being self-employed as well. Um, you know, you I guess you sort of come and go as, as you like, but you're always beholden to, to your inbox. Uh, and I, it's sort of fun because there isn't really a typical day. And I, I joke a lot about this industry where every day I get up and I just have no idea what I'm going to see in the morning. And and very often I get up and go, oh, wow, I didn't see that coming. That's 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 an odd one. Uh, and that's that makes it kind of fun too. That's good. I, I know that you travelled a lot as a child and, and, and as a teenager and you've seen a lot of the, the world. What was it? Like, what were your school days like? Did you like school? Well, it it, it was kind of varied. I, I had a very, I guess, typical Aussie childhood up until I was nearly 14. And, and we lived in a very country part uh, of Australia. My father was a, a pilot and he'd drive into the airport and, and do that. But it, we might see the beach, you know, once a year sort of thing. Uh and we had a lot of space. And then when I was nearly 14, we, we moved to the Netherlands uh, into a row house. <laughs> so suddenly all of our space and all of our things from home disappeared. But, you know, the, the Netherlands is, is very central to Europe. So we, we managed mm -hmm. to travel a lot uh, uh, throughout Europe. And I was there for two years. And then because he was a pilot, we ended up in Singapore for a few years. And I got to see a lot of, uh, a lot of Asia in particular, I guess, obviously, Singapore or Japan. Yeah, and when I I then later finished school, I I think that that helped a lot to have that uh, exposure. But it's it's funny to ask about school because my my mum brought over a whole bunch of my um, results and exam papers and things uh, only a few days ago, mostly to show my kids. <laughs> I think I had a recollection of me being worse than what I ended up being because I, I thought I was always like a, just a constant, you know. Uh, B minus kind of student. I think I might have been about a B plus, but I, I was I was never academically really strong. Uh, I dropped out of university. It worked out fine. Not not necessarily putting that out there, given the the audience here, but everyone finds it their own sort of path. And and for me, I, I found something that that took me in a different direction to to finishing the formal things. That's great. And and a row house is is like a terraced. We would call it a terraced house. And yep. and you obviously. Yeah miss the sunshine and being well, outside <laughs> so we went from having uh i think two and a quarter acres or something you know you, you couldn't see a neighbor we had trees and things all the way around to uh sharing the same wall either side of the house <laughs> with the neighbor so that was I, I remember it i think the house was like six meters wide and everything was six meters wide as opposed to it wasn't that we had a grandiose house or anything in australia when we were kids but you know, it, it just had space and, and all the space had gone. Yeah, that's great. And what, I mean, many people learn on a classic computer and in the UK it was the BBC Micro and the Commodore 64, I remember. What what got you into computing and computing, computer science? Dutch weather. <laughs> Dutch <laughs> More than weather. anything. <laughs> uh, it's funny because I remember when I was... Probably when I was at the end of primary school, so when I was, I guess, about 11 years old, 
uh, and we were just starting to get computers in the classroom. So this this would have been sort of late eighties, uh, and I just remember being upset with my friends who were getting into the computer that they didn't want to come out and kick the football, which is a different football <laughs> to what you're used to in in Scotland. Uh, and I remember being very upset about that. And then I started playing video games with friends. And then when we did move to the Netherlands, that the weather is is pretty similar to Edinburgh <laughs> in my experience. And we spent a lot more time indoors and I ended up spending a lot of time on, on the PC. And I think especially when we moved to Singapore, it was such a tech mm. place. Uh, and, and it still is. But, you know, it, it, in the, I guess, the early 90s when I was there, compared to Australia and the Netherlands, it just had so much high tech stuff. And this was obviously before World Wide Web, as we know it too. So there was something that was a little bit of a melting pot of technology there that helped sort of guide me in that direction. That's great. And what's so great about living in on the Gold Coast? Have you seen my Twitter? <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> uh, it, it, I'm obviously very, uh, very proud uh, Australian advocate. Uh, I also have a, a Norwegian wife, so we spend a lot of time in Norway. We've both lived overseas a lot, and we both travel around a lot. I'm seeing the comments here. The Gold Coast is beautiful. Uh, I, I think to, to to sum it up, it, it's a number of things. I mean, the, the weather is amazing. It's 300 days of sunshine a year. Occasionally it rains. We get very upset because we're just not used to it, and it means it's harder to go jet skiing or something like that. It's uh, Australia is a really big place. When people sort of say, what's Australia like? Uh, and let, let's say they're from Europe. I sort of say, well, it's a little bit like saying, what's Edinburgh like when you, you live in uh, you know, the Greek Isles or, or something like that? It's it's part of one big continent, but it's very different to Sydney or Melbourne. It's uh, it's loads and loads of beaches. If you're at your computer and air, everyone listening to this, let's just Google Gold Coast Australia and go to images and, and you'll see it's very lifestyle centric. So we would only get up at five o'clock in the morning and we'll we'll go for a walk. And the cafes and things are already open. There's people on the beach with their dogs. And people come here because they want the lifestyle and, and they, they're they invested in their, their their health and their well-being. And I find people tend to go to the, the big cities, Melbourne and Sydney in particular, either because that's where they've always been, that's where their family is, or because they have to for work. And there's a to, to, to me, anyway, there's just a very, very different tone in these places. That's good. Well, you'd be glad to know it's it's pouring of rain here today. I oh, know. That's a safe bet. Yeah. And and so you, you created the Have I Been Pawned uh, website. Can you remember what the motivation was in creating this and what your first data set was? Yeah, look, it, it was multifaceted, actually. So I went to work for uh, Pfizer. Uh, and everyone knows who Pfizer is now because we've had the vaccines and things like this. Mm -hmm. But when I went to work for Pfizer... In 2001, no one knew, including me, who Pfizer was. So I used to have to say, well, do you know what Viagra is? And everyone go, oh, yeah, yeah. We know, okay, well, we make Viagra. Uh, as well as Lipitor and Zoloft, and they were the world's largest healthcare company at the time. In fact, I think they were the sixth largest company in the world at the time. Mm -hmm. And I went there as a software developer. And over the course of many, many years, they changed that role into something where developers and technology people were an expense and we need to unburden, what's the word they'd use, unburden the expense and get rid of it and offshore it to low cost markets and all the sort of cyclical stuff this industry goes through. And I became an architect, which just meant managing the low cost market developers, which which wasn't really much fun for me. So one of my motivations of, of building Have I Been Pwned was I just wanted to build software again. I, I just like writing code. Uh, and that really scratched an itch. And I was also trying to take Pfizer down this, this journey into cloud that wasn't just pick up your old infrastructure and put it in the cloud, but using cloud first paradigms, things like uh, web application services in Azure or, or non-relational databases for things that didn't need it. Uh, and, and I really wanted to play with things like table storage in Azure, which were really, really cheap and fast and scalable uh, and I remember starting Have I Been Pwned with about 155 million records, which was almost entirely the Adobe data breach. So to answer your other question, that was that was really the data set. And I thought, oh, gee, that's a lot of data, 155 million records. I hope this thing holds up. Uh, and now we're at 13 billion. And, and it's, uh, it's still just as fast and just as scalable. And there's a whole other story about why we're getting rid of that and we're, gonna, we're on the tail end of doing something different now. But um yeah, a lot of it was just to scratch an itch to build stuff. 
That's good. I actually remember that uh, data breach, the 150 million records. And I think the most popular password was one, two, three, four, five, six, closely followed yeah. by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's it's all the classics, ABC, one, two, three, QRT, password with a capital P and an at symbol. And, <laughs> you know, if, if the website allows it, people will use it. And mm -hmm. I think that's sort of been one of the fascinating things over the years is is to see how, given that the leeway, people will still do that. And yeah. the industry is sort of struggling to figure out how do we stop that and also keep customers. <laughs> you know, like that's yeah. the eternal battle. And as I remember, I don't think Adobe salted the passwords at all it was all very sloppy for a big company like adobe so for, from memory they're actually encrypted and it used some sort of bizarre <laughs> model where I, I assume a key was exposed somewhere as well but it, it was a very unusual one i mean for the most part these days we see we don't really really see plain text anymore but we still see a lot of md5 sha1 a lot of bcrypt a lot of argon so and, and that's pretty much it argon yeah my favorite <laughs> Hashing method. So we do we do hashing in the in the module. Could you tell me how your site manages uh, sourced hash passwords and then how you link them to the actual passwords? Yeah, if easy. it's not giving away too much secrets no, no, and IP, no, no. It's, it's an easy answer. We don't <laughs> like that's um, and that, look. So that there's a component of Have I Been Pwned, which is this pwned password service. In fact, I haven't checked this for a while, so I should look at it now while I'm talking. But this is a service where you can uh, check the whether or not a password has appeared in a data breach before. There's actually a, a neat anonymity model that, that Cloudflare came up with that we use uh, for this. But uh, what we do is we need to load plain text passwords uh, into this service. And then when we load the plain text passwords, then we actually SHA-1 them and we NTLM them because that's part of the, the way it crew with the anonymity model. Uh, but we're doing just over 8 billion requests a month at the moment to this service. Wow. Now, if, if we did get passwords that, I mean, let's make them as bad as possible. They were just MD5, no, no salt, just MD5. The only way we can get them back to plain text so that we can then SHA them and NTLM them is, is we'd have to crack the hashes. Uh, yeah. And that's just, yeah even though that might be somewhat trivial or something like MD5, there is also that that issue of removing a cryptographic protection from data that's been obtained usually via the process or, or the process rather of a crime. <laughs> so we've, uh, we've seen in, in the past, there have been charges and things leveled at people for removing cryptographic protection. So not only is that computationally difficult to do on mass, particularly as we get to stronger hashing algorithms, but that's just uh, that's just a risk that that didn't seem necessary. Uh, plus, there's approaching a billion different passwords already sitting in the service. Anyway, it, we don't have to have every single possible combination of every password in there. That's good. And what would you say was the the worst or the most significant data breach that you've examined? Oh, so many to choose from. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it depends on how you want to measure it. it. Normally, if we get that question at a very high level, I'd say it was Ashley Madison. And everyone knows about the Ashley Madison story. And, and I think the reason why we say it's it's such a significant event is because of the, the human impact, because multiple people did kill themselves uh, as a result of this. It got also just so much attention, so much traction. There was so much blackmail. That happened after that. I mean, this was August 2015 was Ashley Madison. And even last year, I was still getting people say, hey, look, I just got a blackmail email. Uh, I mean, that was that was just wild in that way. Um, we see other data breaches that also have really serious impact on on individuals and, and potential human life. Um, the, the Vastamo incident in Finland, the, the psychotherapy service a few years ago, where they end up ransoming the individual's uh, and then just dumped all their psychotherapy notes. Uh, continuing the medical theme, we we had a, one of our largest data breaches in Australia about 18 months ago was ransomware against a, a company called Medibank, our largest private health insurer. And when the, the ransomware crew didn't get their money, they just started dumping data, beginning with the list of people that had, had abortions uh, with all the PII in there, which was just nuts. Um, to, 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 to shine maybe a, a less uh, sombre light on some of the data breaches. One of the ones I saw recently, which was just, I think one of the most face palming ones was a, a social media platform called Spoutable, which emerged 
in the wake of Elon and Twitter and many people being upset about that. And they they had a breach which which was enumerating an API, a publicly facing API, and the publicly facing API for every user of the system returned, you know, the user's handle, the number of followers and everything. It also returned the bcrypt hash of their password. It also returned the reset code for uh, for their 2FA, you know, like the backup code. Uh, that was hashed, but it was only a six-digit number, so you could easily crack the hash. But you didn't need that because it also returned the secret, the seed for the 2FA codes. You could just start generating your own 2FA codes. But you also didn't need that because they returned a reset link, which is the one that they put in the URL when you do a password reset. So you could have just gone through every single account and reset the password on the whole lot. That was a good one. And and you said that you see some examples of bcrypt and uh, argon2. Uh, obviously, argon2 has the advantage that it tries to defeat GPUs. Have you seen a, a change? I mean, obviously, you have from MD5 and SHA-1 towards some of these more modern. What, what would you say the percentages were? I, I don't know if you could, if you know that off the top of your head, but have you seen a trend towards the more secure hash passwords? It, it's definitely changing. I, I think just for a sense of chronology, I remember writing a blog post in 2012 uh, called Our Password Hashing Has No Close. And, uh, and at the time, uh, Microsoft were just on the tail end of using Salted SHA-1. And I was sort of demonstrating how fast it was to crack Salted SHA-1 uh, 12 years ago now. Yet even still today, we still see a lot of not only Salted SHA-1, but MD5 as well. And I'll give you a perfect example because only about half an hour ago, I made a data breach live, which is the uh, Kaspersky fan club. Oh, yeah. I've seen now, that there's one probably now. a whole bunch of different issues yeah. with that. But anyway, in the data breach for 57,000 records and the passwords were a combination of what looked like Salted MD5 and Bcrypt. And it's, uh, I sort of, I always have a pretty good idea what's going on when I see that, but you, you understand exactly why when you start looking at the distribution and you see that at some point in time, everything became bcrypt and then dotted throughout the earlier records in amongst all the MD5 is a selection of bcrypt. And what tends to happen is organizations roll from the weak hashing algorithm to the strong one. And they say, well, what we'll do is we'll just wait until someone logs in and we'll wow. validate their password because we've got the password in plain text. So if rather than log in field, we'll hash that, compare it to MD5. Yes, it's correct. Well, now we've got the password in plain text. So now we can just hash it as bcrypt and we'll store the bcrypt and we're fine. And every time I have this discussion with someone, when I run workshops and so on, I'll say, well, how long will it take you for every single one of your customers to log in? And they'll say, well, that's infinity because it will never happen. So what happens is you sort of start your first day of the strong hashing algorithm and every password is terrible. And then over a course of time, it's like less and less and less and less are terrible, but there's still always a lot that are terrible. And in a case like this now, yeah, metaphorically speaking, the Kaspersky club's been caught with their pants down because they've got the whole bunch of weak passwords. And that was what happened to Dropbox as well. Half of them were SHA-1, half of them were bcrypt. Um, so that, you know, that the lesson is if you really want to roll from one to the other, you've just got to go through and bcrypt all your SHA-1s. Um, you, you can't just wait for people to log back in. Yeah, I suppose the difficulty is that you would have to tell all your customers to now reset the passwords, which tends to happen after a data breach anyway. Well, so it's that. Yeah. Uh, two comments on, on that. The, the second one is, or the first one is, I agree with your second point, which mm -hmm. is that if you ask people to do that, they'll say, that's what happens after a data breach. You do have to have yeah. a data breach. <laughs> yeah. But also, you, you don't have to ask them to reset it. You can go through and take every single, let's say, unsalted MD5 hash, and you can just bcrypt the hash. Yeah. And then you have this legacy dependency of, so long as we want to treat everything the same, we always have to have an MD5 inside a bcrypt. But so what? That's fine. MD, MD5 is fast. <laughs> you can do that very, very quickly. So you can roll everyone over in one clean go without any impact at all to the users. It's just, it really happens. I see. Yeah. So you're using the MD5 as a salt value for the, for the bcrypt. And then it doesn't it's, have to be the, the, to... It's, it's literally the input string, yeah. you know, and instead yeah. of putting in password with a capital P and an at symbol as your bcrypt input, you're just putting in an MD5 hash and then bcrypt yeah. will generate the salt for you. Yeah. And you end up with uh, ultimately two hashes, uh, a hash within a hash, which, which is fine. Yeah. It works yeah. just fine. Yeah, and I suppose you just flag wherever you you would you have when you have new users, you would just go straight to the 
to the, the well, you don't have to, you don't have to flag it yeah. because if, if yeah. for the new users if you md5 yeah. at first and then bcrypt it well then that's just the same as all the old md5s which you then went through and bulk bcrypted so now you've just got md5 and bcrypt top to bottom uh, that's clever yeah so the generally the advice on passwords is to use a different password for every website so they don't have this jump off that if you've been breached on one website then a hacker goes and tries the same password again do you think this is generally the case for most users or are users generally sloppy with the passwords? I, I don't know if you can tell from your data if that's the case or not. I, I can't remember who last did this research uh, and it, it might have been 1Password. I, I do have a, a working relationship with 1Password so I, I see some cool stuff they do but it was somewhere in the vicinity of a single digit percentage of people use a password manager uh, and if you're not using password managers you are reusing your passwords. Um, and then there's a whole other discussion of people with formulas and things that, that don't work. But I think even if if anyone listening to this, if you just just go around the random selection of people you know and ask how many of them reuse passwords, and it, it will be nine out of 10. And hopefully uh, each of you is the exception because you have a password manager and you're doing it right. But uh, it, it's just one of those things where unless people do something that is unfamiliar and learn a new tool, they will inevitably reuse their passwords. But by simple virtue of the fact that all of us now have dozens, if not hundreds of accounts, uh, we, we cannot create unique passwords across all of them without a way of, of, of storing it and yeah. mapping up which, which password we use where. Yeah. yeah. And so how do you think the rise of Gen AI will change your approach? Can you see an integration with uh, ChatGPT or Google Bard at some time in the future? I think the whole AI discussion is is interesting. Um, it, it feels very much like many of the blockchain discussions we had maybe mm -hmm. five years ago where it is the cause of and solution to every single problem <laughs> that we have at the moment apparently. Mm -hmm. And I'm finding it fascinating to, to see it's almost like the, the the layer of of hyperbole and then what is actually underneath that which is which is useful uh, and and to give you an example I mean we're hearing a lot about uh, AI powered tools for the good guys for the good stuff oh then the bad guys are getting AI and they're going to do the bad stuff as well and then we're seeing things like uh, there was a, a recent story that there was an alleged breach of of Europe car uh, and I thought that would be interesting because I've certainly used them before maybe they have my data. And it turned out all the data was fabricated. And someone from Europe Car said, well, it was AI generated. And I sort of looked around, I, thought, I wonder how you conclude, that's a little bit weird. And then someone with a fancy title at a security company wrote a big piece, which they had a PR company try and shop around, including to me. And they explained how all this was AI, gen AI generated. And they said, it's like a Scooby-Doo plot, which sounded even weirder. <laughs> Anyway, I, I, I smelled a rat <laughs> with all of that, started digging into it, had a Twitter thread on it. We discovered it was, uh, I think there's a library in Python called the Faker Library or something to that effect that generates dummy data. And, and the point is, is that there was no artificial intelligence at all to the thing. It was literally just joining strings. It was like Thomas Town and Vanessaville and you know, these are the sorts of places people lived. And I just thought it was very funny how quickly everyone wanted to jump on AI and say that this is an AI thing. You know, it was everything from the company that was the target of the alleged breach through to the security company, through to the PR company pushing it because it's such a hot thing. And to me, it just perfectly demonstrated that at, at the moment, I think we're having a lot of trouble separating AI from good old simple code and actually knowing where the, where the two actually meet. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I agree completely with, with your viewpoint. And so how do you cope with the legal side of your site? Do you get legal notices from people who are unhappy with their details being shared? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, um, I'm kind of fascinated that we haven't had more problems, <laughs> if I'm completely honest. <laughs> I, look, I, I think a lot of it is is that, uh, that have I been playing has been going just over 10 years now, and I've worked extraordinarily hard on the that the transparency side of things the way it's received by people the way it's positioned worked very very hard on, on the government and the law enforcement relationships uh and and trying to position it at, at i guess the highest moral standard possible given the nature of the data we deal with so yeah to your point about people being unhappy about data etc 
uh, th there's been an opt-out feature there for a very long time where you can go and, and remove your data. I went through a process with a friend that was a data protection officer at a, a very major European brand that, that everybody knows. Uh, and he came back with additional feedback where I gave people more options about how to delete their data and control the data. Uh, and, and to date, I've never had an individual uh, or a company get upset to the point of any sort of legal action due to either their email address or, or their domain or, or being an organization that's been in a data breach and end up and have a been pwned. There's never been a legal problem with that. Uh, and and I, I think a lot of it is because of the things I've just mentioned and, and frankly, just, just giving people replies. Uh, and, and very often many of the companies that, that are and have been pwned have had calls face to face like this sitting here to help them understand what's going on and, and try to coordinate things like disclosure. And I think that goes a long way. There are certainly cases where I've I've looked at it and gone, oh, I've got to be a little bit more careful with this one. They seem very, very lawyery, <laughs> this company. Yeah. Um, and and it's it's unfortunate that sometimes that influences the way I need to handle uh, a breach, probably to the detriment of the individuals in there. But yeah, I don't want to get sued either. I want to be able to keep doing this because I think it's yeah. a really useful service. So there's a little bit of self-preservation required there too. So, so have you also been, I mean, there's obviously money in this for uh, legal people, uh, class actions and, and, and yeah. so on. Have you ever, I mean, obviously you have been involved, you have, your site has been involved in some court cases, I would think. And any idea what the scope of that has, has been? Uh, any good examples of where people have got money back from being yeah. breached? Well... I mean, I'll answer the class action one first. So I've been getting, uh, for, for, I don't know that it's actually been increasing, but every now and then I'll get an email from a class action lawyer somewhere and it's like, hey, you know, love your site. You know, I noticed such and such a data breach went up. We're, we're mounting a class action against this company. Could we put product placement on your website so that when someone finds themselves in this data breach, they get an ad for our law firm? Uh, and then the bit they don't say is, and then we'll mount this big class action and we'll make a lot of money. And then the plaintiffs will get 50 cents each. <laughs> and, <laughs> and this is what tends to happen with class actions uh, against organizations that have had data breach. And, uh, and I've, I've written a blog post before about class actions and ambulance chasing and, and cited a, a bunch of examples where the lawyers do very aggressively ship uh, a shop rather for business. The, the individuals in the class actions literally get single digit dollars or, or something very, very meager. I find the whole thing, frankly, very messy insofar as uh, proving damages to someone in terms of was there, was there data in a particular breach, the data which then led to identity theft or led to financial loss or led to something of a tangible impact on them or not to overly trivialize it, did you get your feelings hurt that you're in a data? Because I've had my feelings hurt about three dozen times now, being in a data breach. And I wasn't happy with it. And I don't like having my feelings hurt, but I don't think that I should be going after Dropbox or LinkedIn and demanding financial compensation for something that was ultimately an inconvenience. So I, I don't uh, I don't really like that. I, I think the AT&T one's going to be interesting because AT&T had two and a half years between originally being told there was a data breach in late 2021 to acknowledging it only in the last couple of weeks. And they had 70 million people and there were social security numbers. And America is really, really lawyery. And mm -hmm. social security numbers are something that is uh, that is a very important part of identity proofs um, in, in the US. So that might be a little bit different. But I've also spoken to companies that have been in data breaches and been on have a been pwned, companies I've disclosed to, uh, often very small organizations. And I remember a couple in particular where they said, look, we're just getting broken by class action lawyers. This happened years ago and we're getting hit the whole time by class action lawyers and having to make payouts. And it's, I don't think uh, killing a company after a, a data breach is, in most cases is a good thing at all. Yeah. I mean, the classic one was Equifax, as I remember, and that they took months to to report that and i think some of the yep. the the executive board were selling shares in the company knowing that whenever there's a data breach then the, the value was going down but in the, in the eu i think it's now 72 hours or so uh, do you see a, a difference in different regions of the world in the quickness of the response to a data breach 
Well, I think the first thing we've got to remember is let, let's say it's a case where executives are selling shares after knowing that there's a data breach and not having yet disclosed it to the market. That's a different thing. That's inside of trading. <laughs> and that gets dealt with very, very harshly uh, and rightly so. Um, I, I, I would like to see regulatory controls uh, and regulatory punishment, whether it be financial or, or possibly even criminal in, in, against individuals in some cases, where necessary. I think that that is a much better control and the motives are much better than lawyers are seeking money. Uh, I do think it's, look, I used to say it was a little bit more, a little bit different in the US where the US was obviously very, very litigious, but then so many of these class actions I'm saying lately, particularly come from Germany, which, which is quite interesting from multiple different law firms there. Um, I think that the tolerances and things have maybe changed a little bit over recent years. Obviously, GDPR, GDPR, I think, has probably been perceived as being uh, a lot more privacy centric than what it ends up being in practice. <laughs> I think there's a, a lot of people who are like, hey, I'm going to GDPR you guys because I was in a data <laughs> breach. And yeah, things like the Deezer breach in France was a good example a few years ago. I mean, that was 200 plus million records for a streaming music service. And so many people um, were very upset because they got a, a notification from Have I Been Pwned months later and they said, Well, I never got one from Deezer. GDPR says they have to send me one. Well, it's, it, it doesn't actually say that. It says they have to disclose mm -hmm. their local um, re regulatory authority, which I think was CNIL or something in, in France. Uh, it, there's a different assessment process for deciding whether or not individuals need to be notified. Now, having said that, uh, if I was Deezer, uh, I probably would have gone out on, on the forefront and let everyone know because... Um, People are going to find out anyway, you know, if this data turns up and whether they find out from Have I Been Pwned or they find out from somewhere else. Uh, I think trying to hide stuff like that out of self-preservation is always bad news. Yeah. And do you identify that a certain part part of the, the market sector is is worse than, than any other? I know that uh, banks are the most attacked, but they tend to be the least breached because they have 24-7 mm. socks. Is there a particular market sector, an area, is government, healthcare, what, what would you say? Who are the worst offenders? Well, I think if we look at uh, the, the regulatory regimes that, that are involved, you know, that the financial industry has got really onerous controls and, and anyone that's had to go through PCID assess sort of stuff before will we'll get a sense of that. And, and frankly, some of it feels quite stupid as well. However, <laughs> there is a, a focus on security there and in healthcare, which is very different to to, to other industries, uh, it, it would actually be kind of interesting to start categorising that and have a been pwned and put everything into an industry sector, uh, and and see where it where it landed. But you know, as an example, there's there's a lot of social media platforms on have a been pwned that have had uh, leaky API scrapes. Um, and there's a whole other discussion about whether scraping is a is a data breach or not. But we see that happen a lot more than say banks. Um, I wonder if we've even got a bank and have a been pwned. I'm curious. Uh, and and if there was, it probably wouldn't be like the primary accounting system. It would be some marketing campaign or something like that. So s certainly regulatory regimes such as the finance industry uh, do seem to make them feature less. Yeah. 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 It was interesting when you started off, you talked about moving to the cloud and, and making use of the cloud to build your infrastructure you must have needed a massive amount of data processing and storage. So how did you manage to build this infrastructure with such limited funding? Yeah, uh, I wrote about it really extensively, but table storage in Azure was was really, really good. And it was literally, I think it was 20 bucks a month or something like that to begin with for the storage component because table storage is is very, very cheap to, to store data. It's very, very cheap to query. It scales really well. You can only do very discrete, constrained things with it in terms of queries. But what it did, it just did extraordinarily well. Uh, and, and that allowed me to, to grow something uh, out of very, very limited funds. Uh, it, it, it hasn't always been that way. The, the costs have certainly gone up. Um, I've had times where I've screwed up the cloud as well. I, I wrote I wrote something, must have been like 18 months ago, about how I, I suddenly got like a $12,000 bill because some caching that was happening at Cloudflare suddenly no longer happened and I, the bill was all egress banded from Azure. Uh, and fortunately, the, a combination of the, the Cloudflare CEO and the, the 
SVP for Azure said, oh, that's kind of sucks. We'll help you out. <laughs> they bailed me out of that one. But that was a bit, bit heart and mouth when you suddenly look at your bill and realize what's happening. Yeah, I, I remember that. And and obviously law, law enforcement have got two sides to them. They're protecting society against bad people, but they also need to protect citizens. So the NCSC is a good example here. We have GCHQ, which is obviously protecting the country. Mm. And then you have the NCSC, which is much more forward facing, protecting the business, national infrastructure and citizens. So there's different messages that, that go out here. And I think one of the most amazing things about your website is that you now see law enforcement using it to help citizens. So can you give us some example? I'd, and I know that you can't tell us everything, but do you have some examples of how law enforcement uh, or critical national infrastructure agencies are using your site now? Yeah, and and, and look, I mean, uh, uh, so much of this is public anyway, so I'm, I'm happy to talk about it, but... Um... <clears throat> There's lots of different ways. I mean, you mentioned the NCSC. I I was doing a talk in London. I think it must have been about 2016, um, and it was it was a big user group, and there were a lot of people there asking questions at the end. And, and someone asked a question along the lines of, um, and, and I feel like Snowden was still really fresh in everyone's memories at the time, and Assange was still there in London and all this this sort of stuff. So people are thinking about governments trying to screw you. <laughs> so someone asked the question, <laughs> so, you know, aren't they all just out there to get into our things and they don't want encryption and everything? And I said, look, every time I've met someone from law enforcement, that they've just, yeah, they've been super nice people, yeah. always the sort of person you want to go and have a beer with, uh, working under very difficult conditions, usually making a lot less money than they would if they went out and, and into private yeah. enterprise, but they love what they do and they want to make a difference. And I don't think they get enough love. Uh, and afterwards, someone from the NCSC came up and went, oh, thanks so much, man. We had some beer and, and they were like, you know, we just don't get, uh, we don't get enough love. We're really constrained. And yeah, it'd be really cool if we could do stuff like, you know, start to to find our you know, .gov.uk domains and have a been pwned. And we just came up with a model where we, we gave them free access and we launched that at the same time as the ACSC, our Australian Cybersecurity Senate. And now there's, I think, up to 36 different national governments around the world that use that data. Uh, and since that time, I've become quite good friends with Kieran Martin as well, the guy who started yeah. the NCSC back in the day. Yeah. And it's it's just been interesting to see that the government uptake there, the law enforcement stuff, probably the FBI relationships, the you know, one, one of the coolest they have fed multiple data sets into have I been pwned, such as the, the Genesis market uh, takedown uh, from last year. So they they put that in there because it's easy then to notify people. They have a, a pipeline to feed new passwords that they come across in the course of their investigations into the pwned password service I mentioned just before. Uh, the, the Dutch are really active. I went and spent some time with the, the Dutch law enforcement in, in Rotterdam in September. So they were... They're really cool. And I just think all of these agencies, it's, it's interesting how much coordination there is between them and, and how much uh, they want to use services like this to help them do their job better. And it, yeah, I, I, I hope that by sort of saying this to people in this way, that the same thing as, as what I said in London at that time, people get maybe more of a, a positive uh, impression of your, your local NCSC and NCA friends because <laughs> they're, they're good folks and they're there to help you. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah. I agree. And I, I see your website integrating with a lot of applications. I see it within my, my browser, on my mobile phone. It forever pops up and says my password's been used in X, Y, Z. Uh, so which online applications now use your website and how do they help users? I don't know all of them. <laughs> it's the interesting thing. We, you know, we've got a for... Um, well, actually, for the passwords, the, the the passwords we wanted to remove every single possible barrier to adoption. So, there's no authentication required, so you don't need a key. There's no attribution required, so you don't need to say you use it. Uh, those eight billion requests a month, for the most part, I don't know where they come from. That there's a few cases where they're integrated client side, so I can see referrer headers coming in, but I, I don't. I don't even know the last time I looked at that. Um, so I don't know who's using most of those services. For the API, where you can pay a monthly or an annual fee for a key, uh, that mm -hmm. there needs to be attribution. So I, I can see that. And of course, if they're making a payment, then I can see that in the in the customer list. The domain searches, I know that the last time I checked, it was more than half the Fortune 500 used domain searches. And it's 
it's kind of fascinating now that we're looking at that. And then when we have to provide support to the customers that are paying some money as well. And it's like, yep, I know them. I know them. I know them. And I, they've been, oh, why can't I buy a product from them? I was really trying to get one of those. You know? <laughs> and there's a connection just to that everywhere. So it's, it's kind of crazy just to see how far that's gone. And particularly the, the number of sort of very formal sounding government departments and agencies and so on that are in there too, from all over the world. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. And I know that Bill Gates is is in your database somewhere. Who's the most famous person that you have on on the site? And can you remember what the password was? Well, I remember there were there were a lot of Barack Obamas in the Ashley Madison breach. Yeah. <laughs> now, wow. were they all him? Yeah. Were any of them him? I don't know. No. We can only speculate. No. But um, it, I I think it's quite interesting. Sometimes people say. Uh, you know, in, in a case like that, it's like, well, that website should verify whether you actually control the address so that you actually know if it's Barack Obama or not. And I said, well, that doesn't stop any, assuming someone knows his address, that doesn't stop anyone coming along and putting his address in the Ashley Madison and registering with that. Now, whether they purge that after an email is sent and then he doesn't click the link because he's not actually into that sort of thing is, is a different question. But just the presence of someone's email address in a data breach is, is not evidence alone to show that they were actually a user of the site. Uh, and in fact, it's one of the reasons that there are a bunch of websites that I, I flag as sensitive so that they're not publicly searchable that sometimes people question. I, I remember one of them was like a white supremacist website and people are like, oh, screw those guys. Who cares? I, mean, they'll, I understand the sentiment, but what if they put your email or someone put your email address in there yeah. and now you're implicated by association as, as having that kind of mindset? Uh, yeah, that's that's the problem. So yeah, look, I don't know who the most famous person is. Um, I assume a bunch of the ones we know are in there, but I I, I imagine it's not like you know Elon at Musk dot com or or something like that. It's probably a little more obscure. Yeah, okay. I I so I, I use Cloudflare a great deal on on my site. I have it as my WAF, uh, and obviously it provides a good deal of the cash. You can place your web content at the edge of the cloud. So, and I see that that you support it on your website. What what kind of things does Cloudflare actually support on your site? A, a huge amount. So, I, I started using Cloudflare when I was just getting massive volumes of requests. Um, many of them, maybe not even not so much malicious, but just 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 using the service in ways I wasn't comfortable with. Uh, and trying to trying to handle traffic flow in the application itself and exclude the bad stuff is extraordinarily hard because it's very hard to both serve legitimate requests and, and reject very large volumes of illegitimate requests from the same process. So by wrapping Cloudflare around that, I started to get a lot more ability to block stuff at the edge. So now Cloudflare does everything from you know that eight billion plus um, request per month to, to poem passwords. Ninety nine point nine nine something percent are returned from cache. It just caches it at the edge. Uh, I use it really extensively to do things like, uh, let's say, when people are hitting the API, if they're constantly exceeding the rate limit, rather than at the origin at Azure having to say, "Hey, four two nine, you received the rate limit too many times." They do it enough times, I just start doing it at Cloudflare. So I just push that traffic back towards the client. So that makes a big difference, uh, particularly sort of on-demand rules. If I can see malicious scanning or so on going on that hasn't automatically been picked up by bot detection, everything, I'll sort that out. Using things like Cloudflare Turnstile to try and identify real humans from bots for some of the services there. And I think Cloudflare has just been a... They, they have a very cool product that's very easy to access. Uh, I use them on my blog. I use the free one on my blog. They give me some services for having been paying, but the blog's the free one, a bunch of other hobby projects that went nowhere <laughs> are on the free one. Uh, and then I spent a bunch of time with um, with Michelle and Matthew in different parts of the world too, and, and they're, they're super cool people just doing a really cool thing. Yep, yep. No, I, I agree completely. And do you have any war stories about how hashed or cracked hash passwords have been used to hack accounts? Well, I mean, I think looking at something like LinkedIn, because LinkedIn was, was it salted or unsalted? It was SHA-1, either way. To, to be honest, once it's SHA-1, it doesn't make a lot of difference whether it's salted or salted, not salted, particularly given all the salts are always there next yeah. to the, the hashes anyway. 
um, th- there was almost a bit of a game going with that after that data flowed around in 2016 among hash crackers about what sort of percentage could they get through. And I think it was a high 90s something or other. Uh, wouldn't have been mine because even a, even a totally random password stored as a SHA-1 hash is not getting cracked, which is, you know, pro tip for everyone yeah. there. Yeah. Um, they were obviously used as credential stuffing lists. So that the thing about having a credential pair is that once you can get that hash back to a plain text, that's now the keys to so many other different places. And, you know, we've seen credential stuffing become a, a massive thing over probably the last half dozen years. Yeah. And, and so what's your advice for how users should set up their passwords? Uh, as an individual using a service, password manager. I mean, that's yeah. that's really the that's really the the best mousetrap we have at the moment. I, I think as we're now starting to get into things like pass keys, that that's a good step forward. We've still got to store them and synchronize them somewhere. So it's you know that's not sort of the end of it. But we simply cannot scale our brains to having unique passwords across the board. Uh, I, I think password managers are also just one of those beautiful intersections of security and usability where they make both better because usually security makes usability worse you know it's so two fa i got to wait for the sms or find my security key or something like that password manager automates that uh, having the ability uh, in the right cases to store your one-time password seed in your password manager so there are services that I log on to that regularly prompt for the second factor and being able to one password auto complete that and go straight through is, is wonderful. It just makes life better. Yeah, that's great. And what's up next for the, the site? What, what's your next big thing that you want to break into? Uh, to be honest, I think the biggest thing is I'd like to make me redundant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think what I mean by that is it's, I, I didn't expect this to go anywhere and we're now, 10 and a half years into it, uh, nothing's slowing down. It's getting bigger. There's there's increasingly large dependencies on it. Um, I'm in the water a lot. There's sharks. I'm on a jet ski. <laughs> there's, there's risk. Uh, and, and not only that, on, on a more serious note, yeah, my wife and I have been talking about it recently. I said, look, we... We really couldn't even go on a holiday somewhere without signal for a few days. You know, if, mm-hmm. if something happens and you know someone either needs support or something breaks, or if there's some you know new massive data breach and everyone's like, you know, when can I search this and have a lean pwn? And that's uh, that's not a healthy, sustainable way to be. So yeah, we're we're just trying to figure out how to how to grow it and properly resource it and get it to the point where it it outlives me. Yeah, that that sounds sensible. So, apart from cybersecurity and your family, of course, what's the thing you are most passionate about, and why? Uh, yeah, it's it's a good question. Um, it's a bit of a mix. So, I mean, like I said, being here is a, is a very lifestyle orientated place. So, like um, yeah, yesterday was a good example. We, we got up at five o'clock. And we went jet skiing with the neighbour. Just you know, out around the islands. And then we came back when our uh, we won't wash it because it looks like a nice day. So we did again at sunset <laughs> and, and it was as nice as I didn't tweet that. I should actually put that in there, but you know, just being out there in, in the nature on something fast, um, which tends to be a theme <laughs> for me as well. Uh, really enjoying traveling. Uh, we, we're going away again tomorrow. There, there will definitely be photos of that on, on the socials. If people look for that, just, you know, but, and that's just purely a holiday. We went to Japan a few weeks ago and it was, it was just a holiday and, I'm not used to going places just for holiday reasons. Um, yeah. So I think probably doing more of that. Um, both my wife and I play a lot of tennis, which is great. It's, it's nearby. We do have the climate for it as well, which is, <laughs> we keep coming back to that, don't we? That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously some of the best tennis players in the world are from Australia. So it obviously breeds them well. Uh, so what does the next decade of cybersecurity look like? And what are the key problems that we need to solve? Well, we'll still be reusing our passwords. We'll still have passwords. <laughs> we'll still be having data breaches. There'll still be MD5 password hashes. I think a lot of the the old stuff will still be there. You know, if, if I think back to 10 years ago, people would ask that same question. And, and very often the question was, will we still have passwords in like 2024? Uh, yes, we have more passwords than ever because the old ones haven't died. They're, you know, they're still there. So I think we'll still have those problems. I think one of the most fascinating stuff is, is the human interaction. So how do we make... 
security more accessible to people in ways where they don't have to be super intelligent. Uh, yeah, a good example is look at the amount of, of scams and phishing and everything at the moment. And you know, people are getting all this advice. Well, make sure you look for the URL, you know, look at the URL and read that as if humans can understand URLs. Uh, yeah, make sure it's only people you trust. Well, okay, well, how do we figure out who we trust? Um, we, we've totally failed as an industry to figure that out yet. And everything we've tried so far has been useless. <laughs> Extended validation certificates. Um, so I, I think that that human side of it is going to be really fascinating. And I don't know if the AI side of it is going to make it better or worse. You know, will we get better at it because we're able to make more intelligent decisions around trust? Or will it be worse because the bad guys are able to <laughs> appear more trustworthy and I'm not sure, but I'm sure it will play a role. Yeah, yeah. And if you could change one thing in your career, what would it have been? It, it, yeah, it's, it's interesting because often you you ask yourself that in your life in general. Uh, and there have been times in my life where maybe I would have said, oh, if, I, if I hadn't have done that other thing, I'd be happier now. But uh, I love the position that I'm in in my life now. And if I hadn't, yeah, I, I hated working at Pfizer by the end of it. I absolutely hated it. Um, and I almost left, uh, I think, about nine months before they eventually made me redundant. Uh, and if I had have left then, I think my path would have been ever so slightly different. And and maybe I, I wouldn't have you know been here and, and as happy as I am today. So I, I don't think there's anything that I, I would have actually changed. The It's probably a tangential question to say, what advice would I give other people going down the same route? And I think just being able to be active in this industry through user groups, through online forums, through writing code, uh, I mean, social coding these days through the likes of GitHub, uh, getting involved in open source projects. There's so many really, really cool ways that you can be an active participant in the industry rather than just a passenger. And, and compared to when I first started writing stuff for the web in, in 95, you know, that's, that's, I think, what is so clearly different today than back then. And so what advice would you give graduates who are nearing graduation about the skills and knowledge that they need? Well, you know, the, the very first blog post I ever wrote, and I, I remember when it was because it was only a couple of weeks before my son was born. So th this would have been about October uh, 2009. And I was at Pfizer starting to dislike my job at the time. <laughs> and I, I wrote a, a blog post called Why Online Identities Are Smart Career Moves. And my my theory at the time was I was interviewing people for developer roles, and every time I interviewed someone, uh, their CV was great. I mean, what are the chances, right? Like every CV says they're awesome, and then you'd interview them, and they'd talk about you know all the wonderful things they've done, uh, and then they're like, yeah, if you, if you don't believe me, I've got references. Mm -hmm. I said, well, but you chose them somehow. <laughs> you know, they're gonna you could only gonna choose the good ones. How do I know if they're any good? And the the theory I had at the time, and this is I guess why I started the whole blog and everything is it, it's very different when you you see this independent online evidence of someone's interest in the industry over time. Now, whether that's the presence on social media or Stack Overflow was very big at the time, are people not just answering questions, only even asking questions? You know, are you involved in anything uh, or are you phoning it in each day? Um, and, you know, for some people, that's fine. It's, it's, it's a job rather than a passion. But I think the advice would be there are so many avenues you have at the moment to, to get just a little bit of a footprint in there. Um, and it might be like me, right? I had no idea it was going to be cybersecurity when I wrote that blog post. And if you look at the first couple of years of stuff I wrote, it was all over the place. Uh, but I put enough stuff out there that I found a pattern and a groove and something that resonated with me. And I think just being out there and being an active part of the industry is, is a, a really good start. And that will help you find where your groove is. Yeah. No, I agree completely. So my final question is, sell Australia to the rest of the world and why people should go there. Well, we've discussed my Twitter feed already. Uh, <laughs> and again, um, you know, to, tomorrow, so I'll give, I haven't, haven't announced this online, but here's where I'm going to go tomorrow. So folks, listen to this. We're, we're going, it's called the Whit Sundays. So it's a southern part of the Barrier Reef. It has the world's best beach, actually the world's best beach. It's got Whitehaven Beach there. It is, it's just rainforest and amazing beaches and epic food. And just Australia is, um, is such a, 
I, th I think it's a friend. Okay, it's different for me, but even my Norwegian wife <laughs> says it's such a friendly place that is so hospitality orientated in a way that that just feels comfortable. And you know, to to give you an example of what I mean by that, we, we've said many times before. What's really nice about Australia, especially where we're going to go tomorrow, is that you go in there and it could be anything from the manager of the hotel that greets you to the serving staff, and everything's a a, a friendly conversation. And it's not like I, without upsetting anyone, I feel like when I go to the US, there's a lot of sir, ma'am, this person does the water and this one, you know, does the bill and, 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 you know, they want the tip. <laughs> we don't have that here. <laughs> we don't really have, but it feels like a lot of platitudes. And then there's a lot of other places you go. Southeast Asia is a really good example where you get amazing, lovely service, but it feels very much like a master and a servant sort of relationship. And I think the defining feature I, I get here, everything from a local cafe to a fine dining restaurant, is people feel uh, friendly. And, and again, there's a, a little bit like our law enforcement friends. People want to go and have a beer with later on. So I come here for the friendliness and the wildlife. And it is a long way. I know it's a long way. It's not that bad. You get on the plane, you watch the movies, you're off, you're tired, <laughs> you get over it. But it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just unlike anywhere else I've been.